Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here on a Friday, wherever you are in the world. We got a lot of people um, registering from kind of all over. So um, in the chat, if you don't mind, while we're just waiting as, as we admit folks, uh, just put where, where you're uh, joining us from uh, in the chat. That would be kind of interesting to see if I have that set up correctly. We've got Ontario, Raleigh, Maine, Maine's in the house, Des Moines, Las Vegas. That's so fun. Houston, Ontario, they keep coming. Well, we're so, oh, Sydney, Australia. Very cool. Um, that's great. Must be, is it, maybe it's in the daytime there. Okay. Well, like I said, we're, we're so happy that you're here. Um, we're gonna get started here in just a, in a minute. There's just a few more folks uh, joining us. Um, let's see here. It looks like your messages are just coming to us, the hosts. So, but we can see them. Um, so if you have questions during uh, the conversation, just put those in the chat as well. But since you're all here on time, let's go ahead and get started um, and we'll, we'll get off to the races. But um, you know, thank you everyone for being here, for joining us uh, this evening for Matthew Salis' uh, In Conversation, Craft in the Real World. My name is Blake Kimsey. You probably got an email from me about this event uh, after you registered, but I'm the Executive Director of Writing Workshops Dallas, where we also offer online classes on the craft and business of writing at writingworkshops.com. So that's my, you might've come through Writing Workshops Dallas or writingworkshops.com. But as an organization that offers workshops for emerging and established writers, craft in the real world is essential reading. Um, the New York Times book review said, craft in the real world is a manifesto and practical guide that challenges current models of craft and the writing workshop by showing how they fail marginalized writers and how cultural expectations inform storytelling. So I'm just very excited about this conversation tonight. And before we get started, I wanna thank Katie Bolin at Catapult for reaching out and asking us to host this conversation tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Deep Vellum Books here in Dallas for providing books uh, to folks here in town, as well as bookshop.org for fulfilling lots of book orders online. So that, that's great. Um, we did have some great questions come in ahead of time uh, yesterday and today. But if you think of a question for Matthew um, while Jenny, uh, while, during the conversation, just put those in the chat Q&A section. Those will come right to me and uh, we'll get to them later. So with that, let's get started. Um, our moderator tonight is writer, critic, translator, and workshop leader, Ginny Bott. Ginny is the author of the acclaimed story collection, Each of Us Killers, which was named a best book of 2020 by The Millions, Lit Hub, and Electric Literature. Uh, Ginny's work has appeared in The Atlantic, NPR, Washington Post, BBC, Lit Hub, The Millions, and more. Uh, Ginny's short story, Return to India, will appear in The Best American Mystery and Suspense 2021, and her debut literary translation, Ratno Doli, The Best Stories of Doom Ketu, was published by HarperCollins India in October of 2020. Uh, Ginny teaches our advanced online fiction workshop and an online workshop on magical realism, and she is the uh, host of the Desi Books podcast. And uh, we are thrilled to welcome Matthew Salisis to Writing Workshops Dallas tonight. Uh, Matthew's latest novel is Disappear Doppelganger Disappear, which is a Penn Faulkner Award finalist and a best book of the year at Thrillist.com. He is the author of the bestseller, The Hundred Year Flood, which was an Amazon best book, a Kindle first pick, an adoptive family's best book of 2015 and a best book of the season, at BuzzFeed, Refinery29, Gawker, and a bunch of other places. Matthew, of course, is the author of the bestseller Craft in the Real World, which is why we are all here tonight, which uh, is an Esquire best book of the year, which explores alternative models of craft and the writing workshop, especially for marginalized writers. Uh, BuzzFeed named Matthew one of 32 essential Asian American writers and his essays can be found in Best American Essays 2020, NPR Code Switch, uh, The New York Times Motherlode, 
The Guardian and other uh, venues. Uh, his short fiction has appeared in Glimmer Train, uh, American Short Fiction and Witness among others. And Matthew currently lives in Iowa where he is assistant professor of English at Coe College where he teaches fiction writing and Asian American literature and studies. So even though you're all muted, please join me in welcoming Ginny Bott and Matthew Salisis. And thank you both for being here tonight. All right, well, thank you, Matthew. I'll, I'll start um, uh, right there, Blake. Thank you. And, you know, again, I will reiterate that this book, um, Craft in the Real World, for me has been life changing, both as a writer and an instructor. So I'm thrilled for this opportunity, Matthew, to talk with you. Now, as Blake said, we have had a, a bunch of questions and I've kind of grouped them into, you know, two or three categories. Um, and sort of following really Matthew's um, book format where the first half of the book is on craft and the second is on workshopping. So let's start with the craft questions. And, you know, in the book you talk, Matthew, about how we tend to uh, appreciate writing that uh, reinforces our preconceived notions and expectations. And a lot of this has to do with the internalized craft or aesthetic standards, which are often, you know, they've been created and enforced by those who've typically had power. In fact, you know, you use the term literary colonization. But really, all of this speaks to the many cognitive biases that we all have, even in our day-to-day -day lives. And so they're not easy to overcome. So in my workshop, I tell participants um, that we need to get past our biases. We need to read more widely across genres, cultures, languages, even if it's in translation, geographies. But that's easier said than done because, you know, as you know, the industry hype machinery keeps driving us to what they want us to read, for one thing. So could you please talk about how you advise your students to get past their own biases and maybe what works for you personally? And then I have a related question from one of the audience members. Oh, we can't hear you. I know it won't let me. Okay, sorry. I keep muting myself, but then I'm not allowed to unmute myself, so I am stuck in, uh, you know, audio um, purgatory. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure we can get past our biases, or at least not all of them, um, and definitely not <laughs> in a semester, sadly. Uh, so my for my students, I'm. I, it's more maybe about identifying those biases. Um, and one way we do that is through audience and, and thinking about who we're writing for and the ways that that shows up in the text. So that if, you know, if we are identifying our audience as one thing and the text, you know, is say like offensive to that group of people, then we can see that it's not reaching that audience and as, writers, we understand that we have the ability to make decisions um, about how to approach our readers and um, who our ideal readers are. So then we can kind of work toward uh, identifying why a certain craft choice doesn't appeal to a certain audience. Um, and we work through it that way. You know, I used to actually make students take the um, implicit bias tests at Harvard, and, and that was fairly helpful too. But no, I don't know. Yeah, no, that I, I've taken a version of that test when I was in the corporate world because they would make us do that, you know. So that's it's interesting that you had your workshop students do that. Uh, I might have to try that too. Um, so related <laughs> question, uh, Melissa, and I, I hope I don't butcher her last name, Ella Paolo asked this. And I'll just read out her question because it's, it's actually a good one. She says, you've talked about craft as being a set of expectations that have been established by and for hetero Anglo-Saxon male writers and readers uh, and anything that is then not traditional is often labeled experimental as if you know trying to forewarn potential readers. She says I think of when the English translation of Gao Jingjian and I hope I'm pronouncing this not right but his book Soul Mountain it was released just months shy of him being announced the winner of the Nobel Prize in 2000 and Soul Mountain baffled the literary world. It was marvelous, yet it was lacking in plot, description, character development. 
And it seems as if the perception of craft has to change from both sides, those who are educating writers and those who are educating readers. And so this cultural change that we're asking for, especially in readers, how will that happen? That's her question. Is it through teaching more books like Soul Mountain? Is it appealing to book reviewers? celebrity book clubs to consider other literary traditions, uh, promoting translated works. You know, what, what, what can we do to help readers, educate readers as well? That's a great question. Um, you know, I've been thinking about that as, as the book has, I, you know, I, I wrote it for writers, but it seems to have reached a lot of people who are either critics or just interested in uh, confronting their own biases and reading. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a kind of fascinating development for me since it wasn't something I thought of at, at all. Um, how do we educate readers? It's a good question. I, I guess, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's all of those things, but none of them, the, the problem for me is, is thinking like, how many books does the average reader read in a year? It's not that many. Um, and so even broadly among those five books a year is not, you know, it's not really going to break those biases down. I think it's more about um, breaking them down in, in all kinds of social situations and, and institutions, right? And so that like, as we, you know, as activism works its way into, uh, institutional change, then I think it will also kind of work its way into the media that we consume. Um, probably the way most people consume media now is on like Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever they're subscribing to. Um, and there's some hope there, I think, um, that, you know, the kind of availability of international content and, uh, you know, subtitling at large seems like a, a way that people are able to just kind of see other forms of storytelling. And if you watch enough K-drama, which is what I watch, um, <laughs> you, you start to realize things about that convention that uh, if you had been watching one for the first time, you think, oh, it's so different and interesting. Um, and as you watch more and more of it, you think, oh, it's so interesting that it, it keeps hitting these points uh, and, it's, and it becomes kind of fulfilling in, in the way that it meets the expectations of its primary audience. Um, I don't know, does that answer that question at all? Maybe it does not. Well, I think it's, it is a broader question because like you say, it isn't just through reading books, it's, it's all of culture. So I think that does, in, in that sense, you know, you're saying it's a broader question. It's not just about the books they read. Um, we have to address it from multiple, you know, platforms. You know, I think like. part of it is like, the way we think of the other is like an exception to the norm. Um, we try to understand the other through the norm for some reason. Um, and it's like even, so I've, I've written about like empathy, for example, and how we try to understand the other through what seems normal to ourselves. Um, whereas like, if we're going to try to move toward different expectations, we really need to kind of like leap into the mystery of the other and accept that we can't know the other at all um, and that the other you know has their own standards and own norms um, and that's kind of like a larger project of self I think anybody can kind of engage in um, but it also means of course like cultural shifts and cultural awareness and uh, more like engagement with the ideas uh, behind the ideas that we have right like where are ideas coming from um, no. Hmm. Yep. So a follow on then, you know, in, in the book, you say that, um, that, you know, workshop has created many axioms like show, don't tell, write what you know. And of course, you know, writers have been pushing back against these. Um, but like you say in the book, we must also push back against the context that creates them, that nurtures them and passes them on. And we can only do that through that deeper and wider knowledge of different ways of telling stories. Um, so um, this is a question from uh, Veena Narayan. Uh, and she's saying, you know, 
let's talk about that show and don't tell and why is why is tell considered boring um because obviously you know eastern cultures as you mentioned in the book too uh, matthew you know traditional stories from eastern cultures t generally have more tell versus show so do gatekeepers still enforce that is that what they still want to see that's her question yeah i think they do i mean um you know on an individual basis but in general i i'd say you know you could pick up most books and there's quite a lot of like there's a lot of scene dialogue drives a lot of the plots that we see i remember reading like harry potter and and i would just skip pages to wherever i saw dialogue and i could follow a whole book that way very easily um kind of skipping any narrative summary at all uh and it, yeah it's a right it's a kind of maybe it's very american like in in the moment kind of thing where we feel like any individual moment we have enough agency to to change the course of our lives versus um, a way of thinking about kind of time on a large scale and uh, the ways in which kind of it takes a long a long time and a large scope in order to change even a very small thing um, you know like again to go back to k-drama since i don't know now it's now it's there and i'm never going to stop talking about it um you know i, I watch all these k-dramas where it's like they're living out of fate and sometimes it's like the same actors are playing like a version of them from 2000 years ago um and they're doing exactly the same thing in the present of the story as they were doing 2000 years ago and it takes you know the entire 16 hours for them to change one small thing in the plot, right? And that's an idea about um, how much agency we have and how much of the moment actually matters and how it actually is like a kind of, you know, in those stories, you're kind of constantly trying and trying and trying to change things. And it takes, you know, an extreme amount of effort and will to be able to kind of just alter the storyline a little bit. Um, versus the way I think stories still kind of go in the West where it's, you know, the character has a lot of control over what happens, often is uh, has some kind of fatal flaw that leads to the conflict that they're in. Um, you know, the conflict comes out of character and the solution to the conflict comes out of character and the character is kind of like the God of the story. Um, like it's just a very different way of thinking about things. Yeah, I think certainly for uh, for me coming from sort of the Indian culture and there's a lot of, in our storytelling, destiny plays a big part, right? right. So there is, there isn't, it's not always, you know, up to the protagonist to solve all the problems. So um, I'm going to move to the workshop related questions. Now, in the second half of the book, you know, you shared some practical, well, quite a lot of practical workshop exercises for both instructors and writers who are looking to sort of break away from those prescribed craft standards and, you know, clarify their own aesthetics. And I, I wanna encourage everybody, you know, to reread this second half several times because <laughs> I find, I, I just keep going back to it every week while I'm teaching as well. So, I mean, that, that, you know, there's so much there in terms of, you know, plot or point of view, conflict, style, structure, very useful stuff. So here's, I have a couple of questions from uh, our audience. One is from, um, Veronica, and she says, how do you think these changes of looking at workshop can influence the publishing industry and what works get published in the future? So it's kind of related to both publishing and um, workshop, but really she's talking about if we do change these ways of, pub, you know, workshopping, it, will it have a material influence on what gets published as well? Yeah, I think it definitely will. I mean, I, I would, I don't know if I would, I, I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't think that it would have a large impact on things. I mean, I think even going back to the reader question that like who reads the most books? Well, you know, other than like uh, like book clubs that read a lot of a certain kind of book, uh, it's usually writers, right? And, and writers are creating the content, consuming a lot of the content, publishing a lot of the content. Um, and so I thought, you know, if you could make a difference in that, uh, where's the kind of beginning point of that and for me that was kind of in the classroom in the way that we teach writers like what a story is supposed to be and how it's supposed to look and what are the right rules of storytelling um how do we talk about a story and so i think i hope that uh if we kind of change the way we teach p 
people to write, we're also changing the way that we teach people to read and teach people to publish and um, teach people to think about like who's important for the story to reach and um, whose stories are important to be represented and how they need to be represented. Um, all of that kind of starts, you know, I guess I just have a lot of kind of faith in, in young people and I, I already see them is so far advanced beyond like the point I was at when I was 18. Uh, just like vastly, like in a, just a vast way um, that I see a lot of hope there in the ability to give them more of the tools that they're already trying to seek out, right? They're already trying to like, it's a great time to kind of break down what you think you know about the world. And uh, students are kind of in that um, soup all the time and, and just, you know, any little push you can give them is so helpful. Yeah, I think to your point about younger people, I know that, I mean, when I was in my 20s, I didn't even have the language to talk about some of the things that you, you know, you've given the language for in this book and that, that I have now in my 40s. But, you know, I think younger people now in their 20s, you know, half my age, and they have that language. So I think they will be more effective at some of this change, right? Um, the next question is uh, from Naveen Rao, and he says, sorry, I'm going to get a little dorky here, but what <laughs> makes a good MFA program worth it? How would you describe the pie chart of factors, say like networking, <laughs> community, time to write, pedigree, brand, um, and most importantly, quality of education? And mm -hmm. does the latter even exist? And how should a candidate vet that out before applying? He's probably asking you to write a whole other book about MFAs, but <laughs> <laughs> if you could just sum it up in a couple of minutes. Sure, I give a lot of MFA advice, I guess, to, to my own students and to, um, you know, I think the factors are usually like time and space to write and think about writing all the time around other people who are also thinking about writing in books like that's a really precious resource and you know you probably don't get it any other time in your life except for an MFA or like a you know a short time in a writing conference or something um, and so to that extent you probably need a, a program that will fund you well right enough that you actually have that time and can make use of the time and aren't working five jobs to uh, instead, it kind of just get the degree, which is worth nothing on, pa on paper. Um, and then I would say, you know, usually I tell my students, once you can figure out what you can afford and uh, you want to figure out who you want to work with. I mean, I think the question of the education is a question of who can give you specifically the education that you need. And that's a question of like specific faculty members um, at specific schools. And so you want to really look into the faculty there and read what they've written and think about whether or not, you know, they could be a good guide for you. Um, and of course, then, you know, right, like just because they're writing it doesn't mean they can teach it, but uh, hopefully there's some correlation there. Uh, you know, I've kind of been following like individual mentors through my MFA and PhD program who have done the bulk of the education that I got at either of those places. Uh, and I think that's probably pretty much how writing the writing education often works in a kind of mentor-mentee uh, system. Um, beyond that, then you want to think like, where do I, where can I live, I guess, right? <laughs> location. Um, but I do think, you know, apocryphally at least, it seems like location is pretty, pretty high on that list. Uh, usually for people and maybe, you know, maybe you want to think about living someplace as, as not necessarily connected to the time and space to write uh, as, as you might think it is. Um, you know, if you're ready to do the MFA, hopefully you're ready to just kind of write full time um, and use like the one opportunity <laughs> you have in your life to do that. Uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to jump to um, a couple of things that you said, um, and then get into a couple of the publishing industry questions. And this, this was a very powerful thing that you said in the book, which is, this book is against the idea of finding an audience. It is for the idea of writing 
toward the audience whose expectations matter to you. And I, you know, Toni Morrison has famously said this often, right? When she was asked, you know, uh, when are you gonna write, you know, with white people in, in your books or for white people? And she just thought she called people out as being racist for that. And she says, I write for my community. Now, this audience question, you know, you go on to discuss and this was a whole new concept for me. You talk about the two kinds of readers and two kinds of writers, right? And I'm gonna summarize and you have to correct, <laughs> okay, me, if I get this, I, correct me if I get it wrong, okay? Okay, so first there's the reader self that knows that the fiction oh, they're reading okay, mm -hmm. right, is made up and not real. And then there's the implied reader, the self that experiences the fictional characters as real people and the one that the writer is actually writing for. And then with the two kinds of writers, there's the writer who creates and the implied author who is imagined by the reader from the text. And this was a very good and interesting, and I, and I would love for you to speak a bit more about it, which is the author's craft choices are not only negotiations with the cultural expectations of the implied reader, but they also determine the worldview and orientation of the implied author, which is the one that the real reader is getting to know through the text. So could you maybe speak a little bit more about this? Because this whole, this one, this bit blew me up. Blew my mind. It was great. So, I never heard it before. So. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm borrowing these terms and ideas from literary theory. Um, you know, these are things that came up in, in structural theory and, um, you know, used through post-structural theory. And, uh, the idea then that like where does you know the the actual author is of course not a part of the text or can't be like contained within the text and so when we're reading how do we form this idea of who the author is because we do get a sense of like and this happens all the time right when you do readings you probably got this happen to you all the time right like where people are like well so this thing that happened um, in the book, like, how did you feel? And you're like, whoa, this isn't, like, this isn't me, right? Um, it's because, like, people are getting a sense of of that from the book, and that that is something you get to control, whereas, like, you know, you can't control the real reader behind it. Instead, you're controlling the choices behind um, who the ideal reader is, and from that, uh, the idea, from that ideal audience, there's a sense of the um, implied author. And so the implied author is sort of like, you know, if you put all the things of the text together, then what's the sense of the person behind it, right? Or like a uh, maybe mental organization behind it, right? Like the moral sense, the like racial, ethnic, gender, all of these different things. Um, that we assume from the bits of the text, uh, including, you know, somebody's name. And, you know, like this changes even when you say, like, write your book as George Eliot, uh, the idea of the implied author changes. Um, and so I don't know, is that is that kind of getting at it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But it, it's a very, I think it's a very interesting and complex idea. And I think, you know, I, I do want to like eventually do some of my own homework on it. But yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. The implied author and the applied reader are contained in the text, while of course the real author and the real reader are not. Um, right. It's probably easier way of thinking about it. Right. Okay. So related to, to publishing now, we have Edward Iwata asks, in the coming years, do you see Black, Indigenous, and POC writers uh, and more diverse consumers changing the traditional canon aesthetics and business practices of the publishing world? Or is this a mini boom and a, a trend that will die down until the next uh, race related crisis? And just a, a sidebar there, he says, thank you, Matthew, for citing John Okada's No No Boy. My wife and I are ex co-directors of Stanford's Okada House. Um, which was uh, named after um, Okada uh, in the 1970s. And um, they brought in filmmaker Wayne Wang, playwright David Henry Wang, and others to talk about diversity in the arts back in the 70s. So I thought That's that was amazing. interesting. But anyway, so yeah, his question about, do you see this as a, this mini boom as a trend? Yeah. I mean, I guess to answer this in a fairly cynical <laughs> way, which is my usual mode in life, um, is to say, I don't, I don't know if racial violence is going to go away anytime soon. And so, uh, you know, 
it's more of like the media is spotlighting this more and covering it more than before. There's always been, of course, terrible and extensive racial violence. Um, and I can't see it kind of going away in my lifetime at least. And so I do hope that um, as these things happen, not that they will kind of like instigate people to care, though that does seem sometimes in my cynical mind uh, what is happening, but that um, you know we can take them as kind of opportunities for change within uh, the community, literary community, and within our own communities. I mean, I think I, ideally, I hope that uh, we can make more change for ourselves um, and, and maybe less with each kind of attack, trying to explain that the attacks happen all the time to people who don't realize that they're happening all the time. Yeah. Okay, so we have, uh, I'm gonna just flip to some of the questions we have coming in. And here's one from Kiran, which I think is interesting. When you receive a critique that is primarily um, along the lines of, hey, what you wrote isn't a story, here's what is a story and you know they give you the traditional uh cycle you know character wants something da 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 da, da the traditional you know craft um approach what is the best way to respond that will perhaps help this other person to be exposed to the validity of other ways of storytelling how do you respond to critique like that i i wouldn't recommend it i guess i would i just personally, I would want to save my energy um, and spend it where I can use it creatively. I mean, just like the energy that you have to expend to do that, it's so taxing and that's like an extra tax that the person is putting on you. Um, whereas you can use that energy to write uh, and to create more, what you, uh, more of what you want to create. Um, I think, you know, like the problem is we keep putting it on the people in the workshop, the you know, kind of peers in the workshop, workshop participants to do that work when it really needs to be the instructor's job to do that work. The instructor needs to kind of step in and say something. The instructor needs to lay out guidelines that won't allow this sort of letter to happen. Um, you know, like it shouldn't be on you as the writer being workshopped to have to do anything like that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And you've talked in the book about how it helps to kind of lay out the guidelines and, and make sure that everybody understands the critique approach, the feedback approach, so that whichever feedback approach is chosen. And that makes sense. Um, there's another question, which, I mean, it, it's an interesting one, but I would probably want to say to this person, you know, you should read the whole book, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the question. Um, why is the gender, ethnicity, and age of the writer considered as important as what the writer says in their writing? I, I don't understand how you can separate those things, I guess, is my question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like if, if somebody's saying something to you, it depends who's saying it, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you say in the book, craft is culture. You know, there's all this stuff behind it, race, gender, ethnicity, all of it, um, because it tells you the authorial choices. That those are, The author makes the choices in the text based on who they are. So it is identity driven in that sense. And yeah, okay. Um, and then we have a couple more, let me see. Ah, this is a good one from Kemba. Can you uh, ask about how can we educate are educators who teach future writers and readers. Many secondary teachers tend to teach writing with a five paragraph essay and where certain parts of the essay must fall in certain places in this rudimentary structure. How can we teach teachers to teach without the same bias? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, it's the, the age old question. Um, it's, it's just so like kind of worked into the fabric of institutional support and uh, who's in government positions, who's making the laws about like what standards need to be passed. Many of the teachers themselves don't like teaching that form um, and would much rather not teach that form. 
but are teaching it because that's what they have to do in order to help their students pass these tests that say they can move on to the next grade and say that they are kind of worthy of support and funding and you know able to get into the right schools. Um, and so I don't know, I mean, there are definitely the teachers out there who maybe have been doing this for a while and just think of this as like the right way to do things. Um, but I, I have a, my parents are both teachers. I have a lot of faith in teachers. Um, I think that most of them do not like having to teach to tests and understand that they are having to do that and really would rather not do that. Um, and what we could do is try to, you know, put pressure on our legislators to not <laughs> destroy the school systems um, and our children's lives. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of general sort of questions. Um, and I'll start with this. This is from Calvin, Calvin W. Pennywell Jr. And he asks, <laughs> what do you do daily to challenge yourself as a writer and making sure that you sharpen your craft? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to bring my uh, Pokemon to this uh, <laughs> reading, but um, I was just tweeting that like, you know, facetiously, but I I have this little uh, fire Pokemon who sits next to my computer and tells me to write fire all the time. Uh, and when I look at its eyes, little eyes, it seems to be like commanding me to do so, um, compelling me to do so. But, you know, I think I, I challenge myself because I, I get bored actually. Um, and and I, I, don't, I can't imagine a kind of writing practice where you're just constantly bored with yourself. I don't know if I could do that. Um, and it seems like kind of against the creative act. And so like the challenges I think are part of almost any writing process. It's more of like, which challenges right, are you setting yourselves? Um, Cause we're all setting ourselves challenges but some of us are kind of setting ourselves challenges. Whereas like it's, um, what can I do with this one sentence and how can I move these words around to seem different and uh, sound better and others of us are challenging ourselves to think about like how our biases enter into what we think of as a story um, and you can do both of course but uh, you know we're always making a choice about what we are challenging ourselves on and we only have a certain amount of bandwidth probably to do that so I, you know trying to put our energy into the challenges that matter the most is a good um, is a good thing to try at least. Okay. Um, and speaking of challenges, so there's another question about um, what readings would you recommend so that we can get more exposure to other forms or structures of, you know, narrative and storytelling? This is from G. Lara. Yeah, so I've tried hard to include um, a bunch of those books in the further bibliography. Yeah. So if you have the book or, you know, can borrow it or something. There's a whole list of resources in there. Um, and I'll tell you, it's probably a tenth of the books that I have consulted with, but uh, nine tenths of those books were terrible. And I tried not to kind of put anything on that list that wouldn't be helpful, um, or that at, le at least I wasn't kind of critically engaging with in my own text. Um, so please see that list for more things. There are a lot of resources out there. Uh, well, no, there are not in a lot of, that there are resources out there um, and you can find them. Uh, and there are some really great resources out there. Uh, and hopefully, you know, hopefully the bibliography can help. Yeah, that is a great bibliography, I must say. I, I've already marked a few books that I'm gonna pick up from my library because I haven't, I haven't read them yet. Okay, next question is Daniel says, um, I'm always interested to know about moments of failure from authors, since they seem to have a way of moving past failures and rejections. I was wondering <laughs> if you could share with us a critical or general moment where you felt you failed. Yeah, I guess for me, I, I'm kind of like, I subscribe to the Samuel Beckett thing, fail better. Um, mm -hmm. I always feel like I'm failing. Uh, you know, that's not to say that I don't also feel like I'm succeeding in places, but um, that the overall project is a project of failure and the kind of writing process is a process of failure. Um, 
and I'm just trying to figure out like what I should fail at, like what is worth failing at um, and what is worth failing at better. Um, you know, it takes me a very long time to write a novel or to write fiction at all. Um, it took me 11 years to write The Hundred Year Flood and eight years, I think, for Disappear Doppelganger Disappear. I've been working on the novel that I am working on now since 2014, maybe 2015. Um, I like to have a lot of projects going, I guess, just because I it helps me to feel less failure maybe to just fail at different things <laughs> instead of the same thing over and over again. Um, <laughs> so I, I often feel as if I'm failing, but there's, I can't remember who said this, but you're only as, you know, you can only write the book that you want to write once you've written it. Um, and not even then do you feel like, I think like it's a total success. Uh, I remember listening to the audiobook of The Hundred Year Flood, and um, there was one scene in the final manuscript that had ex existed in some shape and form in the first draft. Um, it's a scene where there are a couple of Czech men talking outside of a, um, of a like a gambling hall, kind of. There are all these like little gambling halls in Prague. Um, and it's still in the novel. And when I was listening to it on audiobook, I thought, ah, crap, that's the scene I should have cut. Like, you know, I think constantly it will always feel like a failure. And, and the, it's a good thing that it should feel like a failure because you should be getting better, you know, as a writer and as a human being. So that like all the time you're improving on yourself and your writing. So all the time, the writing that you've just done is going to feel like you failed. Um, that's the ideal situation, I think. Um, I, I have another question going back to your point about this uh, book, you know, being against the idea of finding an audience, but about writing toward the audience whose expectations matter to you. And, and I want to ask you this, Matthew, because when we're dealing with publishing industry gatekeepers, they may not be the target audience for you know, your novel, let's say, but yes. their expectations do matter if you want to get published, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do you strike that balance of, okay, here's the audience I'm writing for, but you know, I've got to keep in mind that this is what the industry is also looking for. So how do you strike that balance? I think don't strike the balance, mm -hmm. just, you know, like take solace in the fact that it's only one person, like you only need one person actually. Um, you know, and for me, that's, it. you know, it's always been one person. Um, you know, I kind of lucked into, uh, well, not lucked into exactly, but had the, the luck and privilege of having Asian American editors. And, you know, I can't imagine, you know, and I know, right? Like from sending the book out to all of these other editors, um, probably all white that nobody would take the book except for like the one Asian American editor we sent to. Um, and so that's disheartening. I think it is disheartening, but it's also like, it's not on you, it's on the editors. And also you only have, you only need one of those editors to be in your corner, right? To have a book published. Um, the audience, you know, interestingly enough is always out there of course it is, right? And they'll find the book, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's a question of like, do you want to sacrifice some artistic integrity with the hope that it will, you will make a book that can reach more people who you don't actually want to reach um, in a position of power so that once they buy the book, then they will be trying to sell the book to other people who you do want to reach, but you've already kind of you know, sacrifice some of that artistic integrity by the time it reaches those people. Um, and that's a choice to make. I mean, we're making these choices all the time. That's a choice you have decision power over when in a world where you don't have that much decision power. Um, but for me, that's not the choice. It's not the choice I would make, I guess. And I say yeah, that from I mean, a position of privilege, like that's definitely where I'm sitting, of course, having published 
and knowing that I have an editor on my side, but. No, but I, you know, to your point, what I always tell students when I ask, when I get asked that question, I'll say, you know, make sure writing is not your primary source of income, first of all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, have yeah. something else because then you can, you can walk away when the expectations that are being asked of you, you know, what's being asked of you is not what you're comfortable with, right? So, I mean, I, as hard as that is, yeah, writing becomes another side gig, if you like, for a while till you can make it. But, you know, don't don't depend on writing as your primary source of income from a, just a practical standpoint, teach, do something else, but you, you just can't depend on it when you're trying to get your own work out there. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a struggle right now anyways for everybody, right? All writers, de debut writers yes. in particular, yeah. Um, okay, here's a question. Uh, this is from, um, yeah, he said, this is not a question, it's just a comment that, you know, I love his answer. Uh, you just need that one person, okay. Um, this, this is not a craft question from Mackenzie, but she says, well, she says, you know, who are you reading right now? And also, could you recommend any good K dramas for newbies? <laughs> um, I'm reading uh, a book by no Nawaz uh, Ahmed, I think. Um, it's not out yet, but it's coming this year or maybe next year. Um, it's quite good. Uh, and I would recommend, it's called, it's called Intimations, I think. Um, and I would recommend, uh, if you haven't watched any, start with Goblin. Uh, I think the full title is like The Lonely Shining Goblin. Um, but you could probably find it just by looking for a goblin. <laughs> That's my favorite of all time. All right. Um, and then we've got, okay, here's a question from SL, which it's an interesting one, but he says, I don't like the traditional chase plot. I don't like the Freitag pyramid. I am acquainted with, and I love the, and I hope I don't pronounce this wrong, Kishoten Ketsu form, but I am not Asian. So how would I approach an Asian American editor? I have no idea. Matthew? <laughs> Read Paisley Rectal's book, Appropriate. Yes, that's ask a good book. I have that. <laughs> Don't ask me, ask her. <laughs> that's yeah, that would be a good question to ask Paisley. You know, we should have her on one of these um uh, Blake because her book is terrific too. Um yeah, no, that that's a very tough question. If you're not, you know, of a certain culture and you're writing um like that. Um okay, then here's an interesting question. I mean, you know. You, you you teach uh, and I teach, but this is from, I don't know who this is from, but this one is, does every writer need an MFA? No. It's kind of related not. to, sorry? No, no, definitely not. No. Right. I mean, an MFA doesn't really give you that much as I was saying before, right? It, the, uh, you know, the best thing it can give you is is time and space to write and, and think about writing, um, but you can, you know, it's hard to get that otherwise, I think, unless you have a certain level of privilege. And so like the MFA can provide that ideally, but um, you know, you could do the same, you can have the same education and learn the same things without doing an MFA, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, to your point about, you know, time and space, I'm, I'm somebody who dropped out of two MFAs, um, but I did that because I was doing them part-time and I was working full time. And it was like trying to be a slave to two masters. Mm. So I think what I tell people is if you're going to do the MFA, commit to it, you know, take up, take, take that um, opportunity of that, all that time and space and the mentorship and, you know, try to get a fully funded program, <laughs> obviously. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely fully funded. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, I am just looking, uh, at some more questions and yeah guys just keep them coming but we do have uh let me see oh yeah here's something from kn listman what if you find that what is normal to you with your writing is not the cultural norm so i mean that yeah right. what what do you do then what if yeah i think you try to learn as much as you can about the tradition that you're working in and the other authors that are doing 
something that seems within that norm, um, your literary norm and your literary canon, um, because you're still in conversation, right? Um, literary act is an act of conversation. Uh, you just want to know who you're actually in conversation with. Um, and that's, again, something like you can do in or outside of MFA programs. Maybe some might argue better outside of an MFA program, or at least certain MFA programs. Um, but yeah, I, I think we all want to know um, what an MFA program kind of has traditionally done, has given you a kind of conversation, entered you into a conversation that is be taking place between dead white men um, and sometimes alive white men. And uh, what you can do is try to figure out how to, how to enter a conversation that you actually want to enter into. And it means trying to figure out, you know, who the predecessors are, who, well, who people are talking to, where they're getting these ideas from. Um, and you'll always find a model for that because there are no new ideas, only new ways of making them felt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have a couple more questions. Um, Tiffany, you, your questions, I'll answer them very quickly before I move to the next. And the book's title that you're asking about, yes, it's titled Appropriate and it's by Paisley Rectal. And it was, it's, I think it was out last month, I believe. Um, so it is fairly new. Um, so yeah, it's Appropriate by Paisley Rectal. And I don't know if Blake can put a link from Bookshop there. And then the second question you had, Tiffany, was who is the Asian style that someone asked as a contrast to Freitag? And, I hope I'm not pronouncing this wrong, but I will spell it out if I need to. It's Kishoten Ketsu, that is K-I-S-H-O-T-E-N-K-E-T-S-U. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not familiar with that for myself, but there you go. Uh, and then Matthew, the next question for you from Grace, would you say that stories written by non-Western writers would naturally be non-traditional or if traditional is, you know the likes of the three act structure and whatever um and that they could they can teach us different narrative structures so she's saying i'm just wondering how universal this traditional uh structure is uh, if it is entirely western european or if non-western authors just learn from western textbooks um so she's trying to see you know do non non-western writers also go with the, these literary traditions and I can also answer to that later, but I'll let you answer first. Yeah, the, I mean, you'll find in the book a lot of discussion of this. Um, I think we need to stop thinking of uh, of the white Western psychological literary realist tradition as traditional and everything else as experimental. Of course, writers are writing in different um, traditions, though we also have to remember, right, that the imperialism has changed and uh, affected traditions around the world and also like how we value certain kinds of stories globally then um, you know in different ways the now I've forgotten what I was going to say but Jenny what, what were you going to say I'm going to think well, no I, I mean to echo to echo what you've said which is I mean I so I grew up in India and if I look at the anglophone writing uh, in English, you know, obviously India has a lot of languages, a lot of literature in different languages, but if I just look at the literature in English, uh, especially post-colonial, uh, as you said, you know, much of it is written, I would say, in the Western traditions. Now, there are a few writers who will marry the, you know, Indian traditions of, you know, co coming from the myths or the epics or whatever, or from some of the other regional languages and merge those, but I would say that if I was to look at the big name books coming out of India, the big in, in, in English, they're all written in the Western tradition. And in fact, the Indian publishers are also looking for more of that. Why? Because those are the books they can send to the Booker Prize or you know, to some other big international prize. And so they're looking for books written in the Western literary tradition. So it's a sad thing, actually. There's a whole debate about this in in the Indian literary Twitter world. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, to your point, you know, imperialism, yeah. Yeah, I remembered what I was going to say. It's there is no universal. There's only power. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, let me see what other questions. So that was, I, I hope that answered Grace your question, but um, yeah, all those traditional structures very much are being uh, used in other parts of the world as well. Um, yeah. Okay, and let me see, we, we have only five more minutes and I don't see any more questions. So I'll jump back to my questions because um, I was trying to make sure that we don't uh, miss questions from everybody else. Um, okay, uh, what, you know, one of the things that, um, Matthew, when you were giving us those, um, the diverse storytelling approaches from, you know, speaking about non-Western literary traditions and you were describing in your book how we could try to include them in Western literary spaces. And that's not easy because again, it comes back to needing both educators and readers being more open, right? To, to those um, diverse storytelling approaches. But is there something that, you know, a practical approach that you might've tried in your workshop to try and bring some of those um, diverse storytelling approaches into the workshop so that, um, you know, all the other writers are more open to it. Is one of the techniques that you have for the workshop? Could you share that with us maybe of how we could make sure we allow, we open the workshop for that? Yeah, I mean, I think a kind of basic and foundational thing is centering the author in the workshop so that yes. if the author is working in a different tradition, then um, by asking questions of the author and centering the author in the discussion, not letting the author kind of lead where things go and not kind of offering criticism and um, suggestions for our own kind of cultural biases, then we can better help the author reach um, their own ideal audience. Uh, even if we don't know that much about the tradition, we can kind of hear from the author um, some of the context that will help and we can let the author kind of work out for themselves, right? Like when we ask questions, we let the author work out for themselves what to do about certain things that people are noticing in the story. Um, I, you know, I, I've tried in workshops to, uh, in the past, to have students themselves kind of research uh, traditions, you know, one by one and, and bring in information on those things. Though I think it's, the difficulty is, you know, breadth versus scope and the arbitrary nature of 15 <laughs> weeks of education, you know, an hour, two hours a week for 15 weeks. Um, it's very difficult, right, to present anything that is already a tradition of its own as, as something more than uh, an exception to the tradition that students are most familiar with, um, which goes back to that earlier question. Uh, so I, I'm tr currently trying to approach a kind of student by student and uh, author by author. Um, and, um, you know, also trying to just offer many different kinds of stories in the reading um, and talk through those things as well. Yeah, I, that's, I try to do it through the readings. You know, I'll try and make sure that I'm bringing in diverse writers and translated works. And just even if all we do is have a conversation about, okay, why is this different? And why does it work or not work, right? Um, okay, here's a question from Sabrina Corsica. Um, she says, sometimes the writer's success has little to do with their skills, but often because the industry, primarily, primarily the big gatekeepers have crowned those writers as trailblazers or the great new voice. And sometimes that kind of praise intimidates me and makes me second guess my own writing. So do you have any advice for how not to be discouraged? By the hype machine? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, money makes money, right? In any industry, money makes money. Um, I just personally, uh, I kind of believe in the intelligence of emotions and in that, and in, in the idea that, like, if you are trying to avoid your feelings, they're just, they're going to come back to you in a way that you don't want them to. Um, and so I would say maybe try to kind of love that feeling of uh, disappointment or, um, you know, loss of confidence and, um, you know, try to, try to,
try to meet that emotion uh, rather than uh, try to get away from it. Um, I mean, that's not to say lose confidence, <laughs> but it is to say those emotions are telling you something, maybe something different from you should lose confidence. Um, you know, for example, in the book, I talk about anger uh, and Aristotle's idea like that. When you feel anger, what you're really doing is understanding that you live in an unjust world. Um, and if you can kind of understand your anger and take a moment to think about why you feel anger, then you realize what is unjust. Right? And so it can tell, kind of tell you something else about the situation um, that you can use and, and that you can grow with. Uh, and if you kind of try to avoid that anger, you know, it just kind of builds and, and, and for Aristotle, it turns into rage, but um, you know, it can kind of turn into anything, right? Yeah, I think to your point, you know, channel that emotional energy, channel it, don't lose it. I find as a writer, even negative energy can be channeled into, into the writing. You know, you figure out a way to use it. Um, yeah. Um, really one last question, I guess, and then we'll, we'll stop there. Um, I was curious, oh, this is DB. Oh, this is a good one to end on. I was curious to know your thoughts on books like Joy Luck Club and Crazy Rich Asians breaking through the into the mainstream and seemingly established ideas about East Asian American culture. What do you think about books like that, that kind of break it out, break out and... I mean, what do we mean by break out? Do we mean appeal to white audiences? Like, you know, that's great. I think it's, somebody should write those stories and it's not gonna be me, but like, it's great when anybody kind of um, of an underrepresented community finds success. Um, you know, the more stories we can read like that, but on the other hand, right, like that it's, um, those stories are kind of within a, a kind of accepted dominant norm of storytelling, right? Crazy Rich Asians kind of follows this, um, Western form and it's it's good in that way. You know, I think it depends on your taste, but for me, it's like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna resent somebody else's success. I'm just gonna be happy and celebrate it for them um, and know that I am following maybe a different path. Uh, I think, uh, I, Blake, how are we doing? I know we're, we're at the seven top mark and I know we have some questions, but some of these are too specific that I'm not sure we could go into, but how are we doing, Blake? Well, I, I mean, um, this this was really great. I, I think we got to so many questions and I'm, I just love sitting here listening to y'all talk and answer the questions and um, really, really just happy that we got to do this on even a Friday night. So thank you everybody for attending. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so I've, I've linked to the book. I'll, I'll send out um, uh, an email to everybody just with the links to the books that um, were mentioned. Um, and um, really just thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jenny, for this uh, really inspiring conversation. And Matthew, thank you for writing such a wonderful book. That's thank a you really so much. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Read. I appreciate it. I've attended a few other events with Matthew and just always, you know, very patient and thoughtful responses as <laughs> you did here. So I truly appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Blake, for making this space. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Weekend.